Hey guys, and welcome to Taylor Tech. Today we're going to be taking a look at 10 gigabit peer-to-peer -peer networking between your workstation and your NAS, free NAS server. You may have noticed in my upgrading to free NAS Corral video, as I tried to do some performance testing on the NAS, uh, I quickly realized that my one gigabit home network was my bottleneck. Now, there are several ways I could alleviate this bottleneck. I thought about link aggregation, but the more I researched it, the more I realized it's just a little bit finicky and it's hard to get it to work appropriately. Um, so I felt that my better option was to just make the jump and go straight to 10 gigabit, which is going to completely blow away that bottleneck and make it much easier for me to get the throughput that I need to ad adequately test my NAS. 10 gigabit, what is it? And if it's so awesome, why do more people use it? Well, 10 gigabit's been around since about 2002. Um, it is one of the primary types of networking you're going to find in a lot of data centers. Most major server, most major data centers at least have a 10 gigabit backbone, if not a majority 10 gigabit network within them. Unfortunately, 10 gigabit hasn't really made its way to the home user yet. Part of the reason for that is that uh, the networking gear has been extremely expensive. It is aimed at the server and the enterprise market, um, not at the home consumer. Um, it's more complicated to set up and install, as you'll see, um, although not horribly. And it requires a deeper knowledge of what's going on inside the computer beyond just plug it in and go. So because 10 gigabit's been around for a long time, that means there's a lot of this type of hardware out there. Uh, that's fortunate for us because it means that there is secondhand hardware available for us. If you're a novice to networking in general and uh, you're concerned about this being a little bit over your head, I highly recommend you go and watch iTech Storms introduction to 10 gigabit uh, video where he goes over some of the concepts in networking and uh, on your computer's internals that you'll need to understand to effectively implement a 10 gigabit network in your house. All right, so first let's talk about what the physical requirements are gonna be for this 10 gigabit network. Um, you're going to need on each of the computers that you're going to attach a uh, open PCIe 8X slot and uh, PCIe 2.0 or greater, which if you have anything made in the last seven or eight years, it's gonna be at least PCIe 2.0 or greater. You're also gonna need at least four PCIe lanes available. Um, so if you're not familiar with what a PCIe lane is, your CPU and your motherboard both provide PCIe lanes, which are basically super fast uh, data paths within the computer to get information to the CPU and back uh, very efficiently. Because they're so efficient, there can only be so many of them within a given system. And uh, most consumer systems, you're going to have 20 to 24 C, uh, PCIe lanes available, depending on if it's an Intel or an AMD system um, with an Intel Core system or an AMD Ryzen system. So what is using your PCIe lanes? Uh, some of the common examples are things like a GPU, which will use 8 to 16, an NVMe drive, which usually uses 4, sound cards, which can use anywhere from 1 to 4, depending on the type of sound card, any additional network interface cards you've already put into your computer, which will usually be a 1X. And there, there can be a lot of other options out there, a lot of things. Anything that's a PCIe card is going to use PCIe lanes. So it's important that you understand how many they're using and how many you have available, because if you have less than four available, this is not going to work very well. And just as an example of how you can quickly run out of PCI lanes, if you have a computer that has a 16 uh, lane GPU in it, so if it's a PCIe 3.0 16X GPU, you've used 16 lanes there. If you have an NVMe drive in there, there's another four, that's 20. That'll max out any Intel CPU and only leave you four left on a Ryzen. So make sure you have at least four PCIe lanes on both computers available. So the cards that we're gonna be using are these guys right here. These are Mellanox uh, Connect X2 cards. These are much older cards. I don't know exactly when these were manufactured, um, but they're, they're quite old. Um, they're used hardware. Um, if you look very closely on them, there's actually a little bit of rust on the, uh, the brackets. Um, these are pulled out of some server somewhere, probably in China, I think is where it shipped from. Um, and sold very cheaply on the secondhand market. I picked up everything here for 36 bucks. Um, the prices you'll find will vary. I've got links in the description to these exact items on Amazon so that you can purchase something similar for your setup. Now, something important to note, these are not your standard network cards. You'll notice this is not an RJ45 port, your standard network port. Um, what this is is an SFP plus port. So um, there are RJ45 uh, 10 gigabit network cards out there, but they're very expensive. They're several hundred dollars. They're kind of the new thing. And that's what a lot of these are being replaced with. Now they provide the same 10 gigabit speed 
It's just this is an older standard. Um, so SFP, small form, fa form factor pluggable, are plugs that look like this. You can have different kinds of connections. Um, you can have what this is, which is called a direct attached copper or DAC cable, where the plug is built directly into the cable. You can also have standalone little modules that plug in that have separate cables that plug into those modules. That's how fiber optic is done. So you can get a little fiber optic uh, module that you plug in, and then you plug the fiber optic cable into the module, and off you go. So direct attached copper is the cheapest type, which is what this is, where the cable is directly attached to the SFP plug. Um, there's also fiber optic, which you can do if you so desire. Um, if you're going to be going more than about three meters, which is the longest you're going to get direct attached copper, you are going to need to do fiber. It's not that much more expensive. You just have to buy two of the modules and then the cable to go between them. Um, a DAC cable is probably going to cost you 10 to 15 bucks, whereas a fiber set up for two modules and a cable is going to be about 30. So again, not a huge difference in cost, just um, you know, with a fiber, you have a little more flexibility in terms of more length that you can run it. So in terms of physical install, it's very simple. Simply make sure that you're using a PCIe 8X uh, or 4X slot. Don't use the 1X slots, which are the little short ones that are open at the back. It will fit in there, but you're not gonna get uh, enough speed out of the card. You're not gonna be actually getting 10 gigabits. So make sure you're using an 8X lane, plug the card in, um, and make sure it's seated firmly. I did have problems with these cards initially, getting them to seat firmly. Um, and uh, it was very frustrating until I realized what was going on. Just make sure you wiggle them a little bit, get them all the way in there. Once you have the cards plugged in and screwed in, you can take your direct attached copper cable and plug it into the back of the SFP card. So do note that the orientation on these is at the PCB. Once the, once the PCIe card is in, the PCB goes towards the PCB on the card. And you'll hear a slight click when it gets all the way in. Now, if you need to remove it, don't pull directly on the cable. It does. It is a locking port. You need to pull on this, uh, the little adapter or the little ring or tab that's included to actually remove the SFP port. Um, if you just yank on the cable, you're going to rip the card in half. So once you've got those cards put into both ends of your 10 gigabit peer-to-peer -peer network and you've got the cable hooked up, you actually have a physical 10 gigabit network. Uh, now it's not working yet, but uh, you're, as far as physical setup, you're all done, you're ready to power on your machines and go through the setup process. So let's transition over to the desk and we'll go through the setup process. Okay guys, now that we have the physical setup done, it's time to set up the FreeNAS box and your workstation. Uh, we'll start with the FreeNAS box. So simply go to it and log in. Whoopsies. Okay, there we go. Um, and go to your network. When you go there, you should see you have two NICs uh, available, your regular one gigabit NIC and the new 10 gigabit NIC that we installed. As long as you are on FreeNAS 9.10 or later, you should have a current enough version of FreeBSD as the base uh, so that there is a driver available automatically for these uh, Mellanox ConnectX uh, NICs. So it'll start out disabled. You need to go ahead and, en and enable it. Um, and once you do that, we'll need to assign an IP address to it. Now, something to keep in mind, the, this is a peer-to-peer -peer network. There's no router in between them. So uh, there's not going to be any automatic assignment of IP addresses. That means we have to give it a fixed static IP address. Um, to avoid confusion with the main network in the house uh, on these machines, what I've done is given them a different subnet. So what I'm going to do is give it a different subnet by changing these from one, which is my standard subnet, as you can see on my one gigabit. Um, and then I'm going to give it a 200 in that third triplet. And the fourth triplet, I'm going to give this an IP of one. And I'm going to give it this same subnet mask that uh, the other one has. Next, you'll want to come down and change the MTU. Now this is the same as the frame size in Windows. So to enable jumbo frames, um, you would want to change this to 9000. The default is 1500. If you don't change it, uh, you're going to have issues with um, not getting the full bandwidth. Um, and you can leave the media type as auto select. Make sure you save those settings once you've changed them. The next thing you'll want to do is come to services, sharing, SMB, and make sure that you are on your server max protocol is SMB3. If it's not SMB3, if it's SMB2 or lower, you're not going to be able to get the full speed. SMB3 supports above one gigabit. 
Finally, uh, before you go and uh, set up things on the Windows side, make sure that you make sure that you set up user accounts. Um, I don't know, this may have just been my own experience, but I found that if I didn't have a user specified that I could log in with, if I tried to just leave it as guest, um, the FreeNAS box did not respond well to having two networks that were both accessible to guest. Um, that may have been a configuration error on my part, but just having an account, it's good practice anyway, um, so that your shares are not generally accessible to anyone on the network. Go ahead and make sure you set that up now. All right, and once you've done all that, you are done on the FreeNAS side, and it's time to head over and set up your workstation. All right, guys, now that we've got the NAS box set up, we're gonna set up the Windows machine. What you're gonna do is you're going to go to your network uh, adapter options, and you'll see that the uh, your new Tangibit NIC has been automatically detected by Windows and a driver installed for you. I know earlier I said no part of this was gonna be plug and play, but um, I kinda lied, and you know what, that's okay. I'm always happy for it to be easier than we thought. So go to the properties of that NIC, and in the IPv4 settings, go to properties, and assign it a static IP just like we did on the FreeNAS box. We're going to use the same subnet uh, and just give it an incrementally the next IP address in the network. Give it the same subnet mask because that's the subnet level is the first three octlets. And then um, you're done. Here, if we do have to do one more thing. Uh, make sure you click on configure. Uh, and that'll bring up the properties for the device. Go to advanced and jumbo packets. Now you'll want to set this to 9,000. Again, this is just like the NTU on the FreeNAS box. Um, this gives us our, our large frames so that we can get the full bandwidth for the NIC. Uh, once you have those things done, you should have the adapter all set up and be able to start transferring things. But we're going to do one thing to make it easier on ourselves before we do that. We're going to set up the uh, <clears throat> the host file on our machine to uh, allow us to more easily find that network. So what you can do is you can go to C, Windows, System32, and then, uh, where is it in here again? Ah, uh, yeah, drivers, etc. And then hosts and edit it with your favorite text editor. Hush. And you can see I've added an entry here for FreeNAS 10G as my host name for my FreeNAS server. So once you've done that, save it, close it, and you're set to go. So once you've done that, you want to re add all of your shared drives from your NAS if you have more than one. So you can see I've already added um, my T Tech drive. Uh, on the 10G network, and then I've got my other two drives on the 1G network. So this is so I can show you the difference between the two. So what we're going to do is we're going to get uh, Crystal Disk open. We're going to run some Crystal Disk uh, benchmarks against all of these, and then uh, kind of talk about performance of the 10 gigabit network. Okay, so it looks like the benchmarks are done. Uh, we've got four here. We'll talk through them real quick. Up in the upper right-hand corner, we've got... Uh, a RAM disk, which uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's a way of setting up a quote-unquote disk on your actual system RAM. It's one of the fastest ways you can read and write something. Um, so you can see this is completely unencumbered, and that'll be important for when we do some tests later. Next, you've got my NVMe drive that I do most of my editing from. Um, so you can see that excellent reason writes on that. Then we have the one gigabit uh, from the NAS. That's the Y drive. Um, and the T drive up here, we have our 10 gigabit network. You can see that bottleneck is gone and we're getting very close to our NVMe performance, or at least it looks like it on the surface. But I don't know if you've noticed this number right here, that is actually the maximum throughput for a 10 gigabit network. I don't think we're actually maxing out the NIC and I'm gonna show you why uh, that is not all it seems. So what we're gonna do, Let's get a couple of File Explorer windows open. We're going to take some stuff in from my NVMe drive real quick. Here, we'll just grab some of these. Yeah, it'll work. And we're gonna write that to the, <clears throat> the 
RAM disk. So you saw that wrote at the max reads for the NVMe drive. That's kind of what we expect. So we're going to take these, we're going to write them to the T drive, and you can see we get our expected write performance. That's roughly in line with what we were seeing with the crystal disk test. Crystal disk test. So what we're going to do then, we're going to delete these out of the A drive and write from the T drive back to the A drive. We're going to see if we see this speed here. Okay, so it's not quite the same speed, but it's pretty close. Let's do that one more time, and you'll instantly see what's going on. Boom, note, much higher, right at that one gigabit threshold. What was happening there? Well, let's go back to our green ass box. And as it loads, look up here at memory allocation. You can see we're starting to use a lot more of the memory. Oh. Hmm. Well, it's not as strong here as it was last time I did this. But what's happening is we're actually reading this out of RAM. Um, these, you know, two and a half gigs of files are being cached in RAM and are being read from system memory on the free NAS box, which we know reading from system memory is very, very fast. So when we write them multiple times, or read them multiple times, we see that we get a much better speed. So what happens then if we read something that is random from the disk instead of something that we've just read a few times? So let's go to one of my older videos uh, here. And well, that doesn't have much video content. That doesn't either. Wow. All right, there we go. So we're going to read all four of these files. It's about three gigs of data. We're going to drive, drop it in the A drive. We're going to see what happens. Note our read speed is much lower, much, much lower. So what's actually happening there is it's actually having to read it from disk. It's having to go find it on the disk, spin them up, and read them instead of reading them out of system uh, memory. Now if we go and we delete them and redo those reads, right, go do the exact same thing again, all of a sudden, boom! We're taking advantage of the memory on the FreeNAS box. This is something that is one of the reasons why FreeNAS can be really great as a media server because once you start reading the file, it'll put the rest of the file in memory and you'll get that uninterrupted stream even if you have other people trying to hit the FreeNAS box and get other information off of it. Um, that's one reason you have to be very careful with synthetics when you're trying to measure performance on a FreeNAS box. Um, what we'll be doing when I come back and do uh, different array performance types uh, different array types and their performance is we'll actually be doing real world file copies to see what is the actual read and write speeds in addition to synthetics so that we don't unintentionally get cornered by something like what happened here where it looked like we actually hit maxed out the the 10 gig network but it wasn't that we were actually getting that performance from the array we were getting that performance from the system memory because of the way free nas handles file transfers and we're transferring the same file multiple times all right well i have to say i'm really pleased with that result um this is a huge upgrade as you can see from the one gigabit network we were on before we're actually getting the real performance of the free nas box which is awesome um that's going to let us do a lot of cool things like testing different array types um, and seeing what the performance is like on them versus redundancy and that kind of thing and what's the best balance for different use cases. All right, guys, I hope you found that video helpful and informative. If you did, throw a like on it. If you'd like to see more content like this in the future, hit that subscribe button. Um, if you have any questions or other comments for me, leave them in the comment section down below. I love interacting with you. Um, all the items we talked about that are necessary to put this network together are in the description section. Uh, links to Amazon there. Those are affiliate links. That helps me out a lot. I really appreciate it when you all use those. Um, thanks for watching, guys. Have a good one.